Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I would like to share with you a breakdown of how the Ironman World Championship race in Nice, France went. It was an epic and brutal day of celebrating the sport that changed my life, Ironman triathlon, with high highs and very low lows, physical and mental breakthroughs, new challenges, and surprises. It was to date the hardest day of my life, no questions asked, that exceeded everything I was expecting in the good and in the bad, forced me to push through many barriers and definitely it was a transformational experience that I very probably will never forget. I'm making this video in an effort to share what I learned on the day of the event with you guys in order for you to maybe adopt some of the strategies I used to your benefit and have a better race. But even more, avoid making mistakes that I made. Learning by experiencing things on our own skin is a great teacher, but I believe some of the mistakes I made, you are way better off just skipping them without experiencing them. And likewise, I really think I did nail some things in this race that I hadn't done in previous events, be it because of lack of fitness in previous events or different gear or mindset. Before getting stuck into the details, a word from the sponsor of today's video. This video is sponsored by 4Endurance. 4Endurance is an online store for sport nutrition and performance enhancing supplements, whose objective is to help athletes realize their athletic potential, be them professional or being recreational age groupers. They have a huge variety of gels, drinks, supplements from various brands and from their proprietary 4Endurance and 4Endurance Pro brand. The products that I love are the Endurance gels, both the non-caffeinated and the caffeinated version, which have the perfect consistency, in my opinion, to be taken both on the bike, but especially on the run without having any discomfort, and Endurance Energy Drink. These products all have a 1 to 0.8 glucose to fructose ratio plus electrolytes. Another product that I use is Fusion, a blend of caffeine, ginseng, but especially Rhodiola rosea, which I found to contribute to a reduction of fatigue and perceived exertion. So go check out 4 and use code PATRICKD10 for 10% off your next order. And this code is valid all across Europe. And now back to the world champs. To start off, the Ironman World Championship 2023 for male athletes was going to take place on the 10th of September in Nice. France. This was going to be the very first time that the Ironman World Championship was going to take place outside of the US, being hosted in Nice City with, I don't know about this, but quite a bit of tradition in the long distance triathlons. It was going to be, simply put, quite a challenging event, both for the conditions and the course. I've already talked at length about the course, but I will give you just a quick breakdown of the race course, which is arguably one of the hardest out there, in my opinion, in the Ironman circuit. The swim was going to be a single loop, 3.8 kilometer swim, taking place in the Bay des Anges, a truly beautiful beach that sits right along all the coast of Nice City. This bay is known for its characteristic super blue water. I saw it named Gatorade water on social media, as it is a very particular intense blue color. The course is fairly straightforward, and in the morning the sea is usually very calm if it is good weather. But there is the possibility of some swells picking up, and especially the water temperature had a concrete possibility of being high and above the 24.5 degree cutoff. So a non-wetsuit swim was likely. Another thing that was going to make this course more challenging and more epic was going to be the swim start. It wasn't going to be a five second interval rolling start from the, like all the other events I'd done. But it was a age group divided, deep water, mass start. Each age group, so 300 people potentially, would get in the water, swim 25 meters out to a line of two buoys and wait for the horn to sound off and start all together. This sounded epic and quite a bit daunting, very different from all previous events that I'd done. T1 was going to be a fairly long transition, running up from the beach and then left all the way to the bikes. The bike course was going to be a single loop, full distance, 180 kilometers with 2,400 meters of elevation gain spread out on three main climbs. This course was going to be tough and challenging due to its unrelenting nature. A lot of climbing, but also a lot of semi-rolling sections with some climbs. And the conditions also would come into play here. Some sections had the possibility of wind, especially on the last big downhill as the wind picks up early afternoon and blows up the valleys and the gorges, making it so you have to pedal and push power even on the downhills, as the grade is not very steep. I made a video about the bike course recon and you can check it out here. This course I described before the event as being brutal and beautiful. And now in retrospect, it's a great definition in my opinion. If the climbs and descents are tough, the nature and surroundings of the course are breathtaking at points, really beautiful. I was very much looking forward to the single loop aspect of the course also, very different from what I'd done previously. And it felt more like an adventure, like something like going on an epic ride. The run was going to be a four loop, 42.2 kilometer run on the Promenade des Anglais. The Promenade is the strip of road and concrete that runs along the beach between the sea and the city. The course in and of itself is very flat, but here the biggest factor is the heat. Being completely composed of concrete, with heat bouncing off the buildings right next to it, this would heat up the course quite a bit, unless some wind from the sea would be blowing. And this heat aspect 
was made even harder by the fact that there was zero shade along the course. The sun would be high up in the sky when we would start, around 1 or 2 p.m. And there was not going to be a lick of shade anywhere. I'm talking zero shade at all, which was something I had never experienced before on any course. A hot run with no shade. What can I say? This event sounded like a true hardcore challenge. As I've explained in previous videos, I qualified with a roll down slot at Ironman Hamburg, coming in at 44th in my age group, which had 23 slots. A couple of weeks after the race, I received an email with the slot allocation and I took it, as I felt training for this goal would force me to level up and push beyond what I had ever done before, both in training and in my mindset. I'm super glad that I took this opportunity. The great thing about Nice was going to be the logistics to get there. It was going to be so easy. At the moment I'm living in Turin, Italy, and I simply packed up all my stuff on Wednesday and headed down by car to Nice. A three hour drive, which ended up being super straight. I got to Nice, I booked a very central apartment around 500 meters from the start. During the past events, I realized that being super close to the race start, even if it might cost a little bit more, is so useful to just not have any hassles with transportation and no added stress on race morning. Put all my gear in the house and I headed straight to the promenade to see what was going on. There were many people moving, building, preparing the transition areas and the finish line for Sunday. I started getting a bit excited. It was all getting real. To be honest, Nice is also a pretty cool city. It has new flashy buildings and hotels, but also small streets that hold a lot of traditional character, a million different restaurants ranging from super high end to super cheap, but also local spots. Uh, French cuisine, kebab houses, and the like. Hey guys, what is going on? It is uh, Thursday morning here in Nice. I'm just going to go for a practice swim down here at the beach. Early morning, kind of like the same time that the race will be start. And then I went to the race expo to register. Here I got my bib, my backpack, and the event swag, as well as the transition bags. There was also an informal race briefing that I stumbled upon, so I just chilled there and started listening to the transition zone specifics, etc. Then I visited the expo, meeting a couple of people that I knew online. I didn't buy any gear because I have a superstition. Never buy any gear before you cross that finish line. That's what I stick to usually. The weather's hot, man. It's 11 a.m. and it's really, really hot. It's gonna be a tough day, Sunday. It's registration done, got the backpack. I'm off for a 20 minute bike ride. Hi, Roman. Where is the cheap? It's going to be an incredible, incredible weekend. Thursday evening, I went to the welcome party and the banquet and I got to chill with some Italian guys. There were a lot of people and you could really feel this sort of like world-class event feeling to it. It was a huge venue, so many people from all across the world. It was pretty awesome. Friday was kind of the same as Thursday. I did the last run session with Sebastian, a dude that I only knew online and it was awesome to meet in real life. And to be honest, this aspect was a big highlight for me in Nice, as a lot of people that I only knew from online were going to be there physically. And it was really cool to meet up, chat, see how their training had been going and share a bit of the journey together. This run session also highlighted one thing. The heat was going to be a major factor, a lot more than I expected. There had been a mini heat wave going on uh, starting from the day after I had arrived, which had A, warmed up the sea above the wetsuit limit, but especially it made it so on the run course, the temp at two o'clock was going to be a solid 35 degrees Celsius with no shade to be found anywhere. The heat would definitely become a factor. The day before the race is always a fairly full and stressful one. I did three 10 minute mini taper sessions, so swim, bike, run, plus transition bag prep. This time I also did an Instagram takeover for the Super Sapiens account, which was great because it helped me as a accountability for all the prep, as I had to take photos, videos, and double check everything, basically. I got the three swim bike run sessions done. For swimming, I tested out the swim skin I had gotten specifically for Nice, in the event that the swim was non wet It felt very good in the water. This was the first time I was using a swim skin. All that a swim skin does is have a more hydrophobic material, which should make you a little bit faster. But I find that especially, it covers completely the back pockets of the tri-suit, and the neck area, avoiding drag. One of the questions that I got the most is, is a swim skin worth it? And in my experience, if the swim is non-wetsuit, a swim skin in the 100 to 150 euro price range is a solid choice. No more, I wouldn't spend any more money on it, but it definitely does give an advantage. The bike was a super short session, 
just basically to check that everything is working as the Motive app instructed me. I changed the batteries in the power meter and in the SRAM blip box and everything was working smooth. Then I did a 10 minute run just to move the legs. Gear bag prep and transition prep was going to be fairly similar to how I had approached Hamburg with tried and true strategies that I knew worked being done again with just a few changes. Here is a breakdown of the gear and nutrition that I was going to use. For the swim, I had a tri suit from Ale, foam swim goggles, hoob race swim skin in the case of a non wetsuit swim, and a Sumapo Victory wetsuit in case of a wetsuit swim. In the bike bag, I had Aero socks and a Limar Air King TT helmet. The bike course, in my opinion, is perfect for a full TT bike setup, as the climbs are never really super steep and there is a lot of rolling sections. Aerodynamics as well as weight definitely play a big part. I also put my usual green standard Monster Energy, poured in a quick drink Powerade bottle to down while I got changed, and two or three of the caffeine gels that I was gonna use for the ride. One every hour at the beginning of every hour. The gels are by Endurance and they have both carbs and caffeine, and the caffeine is 65 milligrams per gel. The run bag was going to contain my Alphafly V1s. I reflected a lot if to use these shoes or to change them after Hamburg. As in Hamburg, I felt that they actually might have been a hindrance towards the latter stages of the marathon when the form breaks down. But on the flip side, I knew that they worked well. Also, one thing to note is that I felt that I had made some progress on the run regarding both form and leg strength. So maybe I thought that I wouldn't have those fatigue problems during the run. These Alpha Flies have elastic laces on them for quick in insertion and locking. Also in the run bag, I had some extra caffeine gel, some four endurance fusion caps, and some safety ibuprofen. All in one Ziploc bag. The Ziploc bag went into my Motive running cap with the shades, so all I had to do was grab the cap from the bag and everything I needed was inside it. The full nutrition plan was going to be one endurance caffeine gel at the start of every hour, plus one endurance gel at 30 minute mark. The rest of the calories would come from cola and Gatorade. The target was to hit 120 grams per hour of carbs on the bike and at least 90 on the run. Hitting these numbers I felt had really helped in Hamburg to preserve energy for the final phases of the run. The more carbs I managed to get in on the bike, I knew that that would directly translate to me being able to hold the highest intensity possible on the run and hopefully not fading. Supplements were going to be three caps of four endurance fusion in the morning. So rhodiola, caffeine, ginseng, one cap of the same fusion mid bike when I was starting to fatigue and one capsule of fusion during the first part of the run. Fusion I found noticeably lowers perceived exertion. So I was going to try and take it during the race and see how that worked out to hopefully stave off fatigue. I double, triple checked all of this and at one o'clock, it was my book time for bike racking. I went towards the transition zone and there were already so many people there and man, I started feeling the nerves. Then I made my way into the transition zone, both with the bags and the bike. I dropped off my swim to bike bag, then I went to rack my bike. Here I deflated the tires as the heat was pretty strong. And actually while I was there, I heard a tire pop from another bike who hadn't deflated them. So this is something that can often be forgotten, but I think it is fairly important to ensure that you don't have to change a flat on race morning. Having racked my bike, I had a really good walk around the transit, noticing and identifying landmarks to remember where my bike was in order to be efficient the day after. I went from the swim exit right all the way through transition to my bike and then towards the run. Having done that, I headed towards the exit. I racked my run bag and then at the exit, I got my timing. It was done. Okay, so the bike is racked, got my chip for tomorrow. It's all done, it's over. It always feels kind of stressful when you take all your bags in. So I'm really glad it's over. Now all that's left to do is to relax, chill out, carb up and sleep. Walking home, I went by the finish line arc. And that moment when I looked at it, it hit me just how much work and arguably the most important of all the work done up to this point needed still to be done to reach the finish line arch. But I didn't feel nervous though. I felt focused and ready for the challenge. Early dinner was just a bit of rice. In Hamburg, I made a huge mistake and I probably simply had eaten too much rice. And another thing was it had been parboiled rice, which I don't think it really digests well. So this time I did a very simple 250 grams of basmati rice, eating 200 grams normal and 50 with some rice milk and cane sugar. Dinner being done, it was time to try and get some much needed sleep. As I lay down in bed, my mind was racing, thinking about all the things I needed to do the next morning and excited about the journey I was about to go on. In the darkness, I thought about the last months, about all the hard moments, all the times that I didn't want to train, but also about the mental, physical, and spiritual breakthroughs I had had. I thought about how all of this is a huge privilege and an opportunity to grow 
progress and test myself. Ironman is a race, but I'm not a competitive person. As in, I don't have any desire to beat other people or get a certain age group standing or win a race. But I'm very competitive with myself. All the training is to advance and progress my abilities further than the last time, so that I can race harder than the last time, so that I can grow more than last time. And in training, in my experience, there is a moment in Ironman prep towards the end of the last week of big volume serious training, where you shift from feeling like a tired wreck to feeling fit and ready for whatever. What seemed like a monster session just a couple of months prior feels like normality. And this translates also to everyday life situations and hard moments. They get easier and easier to overcome, I found. Tomorrow was going to be the big day. It was going to be another big test for my mind, body and spirit. The alarm clock was set up for 4.15 a.m. I needed to sleep as much as possible, but I just couldn't get into deep sleep. All night I had patchy, broken up sleep, ended only by the alarm clock going off. This was definitely not ideal, but I felt good. I already knew that not getting really good sleep was going to influence the later part of the event in some way, but, but feeling good was a very welcome change compared to the previous two times when I did an Ironman and I felt sick on both occasions. I pulled out my phone and started checking things off the list. Packing the things I needed for the bike, the eat up batteries, while having breakfast. Lists I find to be essential, especially for race morning. Having just to check boxes, you can kind of go on autopilot mode, all while being sure that you have everything you need. This time also breakfast I changed. I did a coffee, one banana with a small amount of chestnut jam, and around 30 grams of rice with rice milk and unrefined cane sugar. Very little food compared to other times. Staying light in Hamburg had paid off, even though I had been basically forced to do it because I was sick, so I decided to kind of replicate this in Nice, but having a little bit of breakfast. Then the final stages of prep, which are crucial to nail, especially if you are at a race solo like I was, with no one who can help you. First off, putting on the temporary tattoos on my arms. Call me naive and easily excitable, but putting on the tattoos brought back memories of my first 70.3, the only race where I had had to put temporary tattoos on. And it felt rad. I thought how much had changed from that day. And having to put them on now felt epic. I'm not gonna lie. Then, timing chip, watch, tri suit, HR strap went on, swim cap in my hand, streetwear bag was in my backpack, with some spare goggles, I popped some music in my ears and before I knew it, I was outside, walking in the dark towards the start area, drinking some carbs and a little bit of caffeine from a cherry Coca-Cola and taking in as much as possible of the moment. The weather was warm, a typical end of summer Mediterranean feeling was in the air. This really felt like a one of a kind moment that possibly would never happen again. I was much calmer and relaxed another time. Since I knew that in the eventuality that anything was missing or I needed something, the apartment was super close by and I could head over and get anything I needed in a very short time. As I got to transition zone, there was one crucial piece of information, the water temp. After walking past a couple of rows of bikes, I heard on the loudspeaker, the water temperature this morning is 24.8 degrees, over the limit. Wetsuits are not allowed for the swim. Hearing this just a couple of years ago would have sent shivers down my weak swimmer spine. Swimming is by far my weakness and wetsuits, let's face it, help. On top of that, I don't really deal very well with the cold in water and having a water temp just above the limit would be quite tough, I perceived. Also because of that, it would be kind of cold. But to my astonishment, my only reaction to the news wetsuits were not allowed was good. This is exactly what I wanted, why I signed up for this and why I'm here. A new, harder, more exciting challenge. This will get me out of my comfort zone, doing something I have never done before the full distance open water sea swim without the crutch or wetsuit to help. This is a skill that triathletes need to know how to do. A real world championship deserves just that. A fair and honest swim with no wetsuit and a non-wetsuit swim is something that you need to know how to complete in a race. That was true, I wanted this challenge and in the days prior to the race, I had actually thought this many times, how a non-wetsuit swim would have been the final missing piece of the puzzle to make this day really challenging and completely radically different from previous race experiences that I had. No wetsuit, a brutal bike course, and very probably hardcore heat on the run. Good, let's go. I switched off all the nerves and I locked into get it done mode. I was calm, collected, and focused. As I walked into the bike racking area and I reached my rack, number 780, I put my headlamp on and proceeded in doing the routine I knew so well. Electronic group set batteries in the derailers. Shoes, loose laces, and locked in the pedals. Bottles, full and in the cages. Gear, the right one to start pedaling. Not too hard and not too soft. I borrowed a pump and chatted with a guy from Texas that had his bike racked next to me. 
while we were doing the last preparations on the bikes. And I pumped up the tires with the values I'd memorized. Seven bars in the front and eight bars in the back. This had become automated at this point after making a mess of the pressure in Hamburg and having to go back to double check. Learn from your mistakes so you don't have to repeat them. As the sun was starting to show its first colors behind the old port hill, I took a final look at the bike and headed towards the swim start. While I was queuing for a last portaloo stop, Charles, a friendly guy, came up to say hi and we chatted a bit about the YouTube channel, the vids, and it was so nice and helpful to get some positive energy and lower the nervousness that I was feeling because I was starting to feel a bit tense now. It really helped to distract from the nerves. Thank you, Charles. And this thing also had been happening time and time again the days before with people stopping to say hi and chat. Thank you and it was a pleasure to meet so many of you in person and chat. Now it was time to prep and put on the final race setup. Found a spot under the tree, I pulled up my tri suit, zipped it up and then put on the new piece of kit, swim skin. So a swim skin is a hydrophobic compressive layer that goes over your tri suit. Even though everyone told me to not worry and that Nice, yeah, it's gonna be a wetsuit swim. I had a gut feeling that it wasn't gonna be so. So I just bought one in the off chance that it wasn't gonna be wetsuit legal. And boy, did that choice turn out to have been the right one. It is marginal gains, but I definitely would recommend one for open water, non wetsuit swims. The time advantage can be between one to three seconds per 100 meters. I took out my form goggles, my hour cap to use as a first layer, and the world champs cap to use as a top layer. Being that the swim was gonna be a mass start, it was probably gonna be chaotic. I always wear a double cap solution. So a swim cap, then the goggles, and then another swim cap on top, because this minimizes the risk of losing your goggles in the case of getting kicked or punched. And just like that, I made my way to the beach. The energy was really high at this moment. Music, speaker announcing, three, two, one, the cannon firing, and they're off, and the pros are stuck. Nervousness became focus and determination. As I, but in reality, all the people around me, we were all about to embark on this challenge. Alone, of course, but together at the same time. Everyone who was about to set foot across that start line had been on a very similar journey to what I had been on, sharing months of highs, lows, and work to get here. The thought that struck me was that even just reaching the start line, fit, healthy, and ready, was a huge milestone. Our wave start was going to be at 7.15 sharp. The swim was gonna be a deep water mass start with everybody from each individual age group starting together. Yet another first experience. I turned on the goggles. I was doing jumping jacks, swimming my arms to warm up. I exchanged a few words with an Italian guy and we made our way down the beach towards the water, taking the last few steps until our feet touched the sea. I dove in, took a couple of strokes to reach the Roca swim boys where the actual swim would start. The water, to my pleasant surprise, was warm. I placed myself on the left, off to the side of the start, to avoid being right in the middle of the washing machine of arms and legs that was about to happen. The horn blared and we were off. Head down in the water, I started swimming. The water was crystal clear, beautiful, and I could see everyone around me. I focused on swimming efficiently, finding some feet to follow and getting into a rhythm that I felt would be sustainable. Being able to follow someone's feet and actually draft off them makes it so you need to sight less. And this in turn slows you down less as sighting almost always produces more drag as the legs sink. Also, whenever I did sight, the light was very easy to sight in and I could easily see other swimmers and the boys. I was swimming, for me, very decently, clocking in a steady 144 pace with a very manageable effort. For the first time, I was actually enjoying the swim. Breathing to the left side, I could see the Mediterranean coast and the sun rising and its light reflecting on the rippling surface of the water. In this moment, I felt strangely at peace. This felt epic. I felt focused, connected, and ready for the challenge ahead. But of course, the smooth swimming came to a halt when we reached the slower swimmers of the wave that had started five minutes ahead of us. Here, I needed to start navigating around swimmers and sighting to spot the silver caps in the midst of the red ones to see the 30-34 age group swimmers I was swimming with before. Here, the kicks and punches started happening. I semi-dislocated my left thumb, colliding with the elbow of another swimmer, as well as narrowly avoiding many more kicks in the face by other people. Especially turning around the second farthest out buoy, the carnage got real, as the buoy causes a big bottleneck with people switching to breaststroke, which is super dangerous. But I kept on making forward progress. At the one and a half kilometer mark, reality set in, and I wasn't having fun anymore. The swim stroke still felt relatively fast and efficient, but having to break it up to navigate around other swimmers was making the overall pace slower. Then, just as I caught up with the slower swimmers from the wave before, I got absolutely swam through, actually run over by the faster swimmers from the wave after me, who just came charging. I used this as an opportunity to try and stay on their feet for as much as possible, as I knew that they were going to cause separation in the swimmers in front of me, 
and I could use that space to swim past the slower swimmers, trying to hang on to them as much as possible before losing contact with these guys who basically were fish in the water, very different from me. The course was M-shaped and I swam through the congestion in the buoys close to the beach and I started heading back out, always having to navigate through people. A bit of a swell had also built up, but it was nothing major. I made my way all the way out again around the first buoy and then around the last far out buoy. And it was time to swim towards the beach on the final straight stretch. Let's go, I thought. It's almost over. After some more dodging of swimmers, I suddenly went from seeing completely cerulean blue in all my surroundings to seeing the pebbles of the seabed. This meant one thing, the beach was close. I was almost there. I took 12 more strokes and I put my feet down, touching the smooth gray pebbles. I popped out of the water, grabbed the hand of a volunteer, and I was out on the black carpet, heading towards the swim exit. The swim time for 3,800 meters was one hour and 13 minutes. Three minutes slower than my target time. I ran under the arch, signaling the swim exit, and I made my way up to the transition zone, while I peeled off my swim cap, goggles, and pulled down my swim skin. The transition zone was fairly long. Running with my swim cap in my hands, I focused on being as efficient as possible to make up some time that I lost on the swim, grabbing my T1 bag and heading towards the changing tent. Bike helmet on, aero socks on, gels in the back pockets. Monster energy down in one single gulp. Goggles and cap in the bag. Just like that, I started running, threw my bag in the bin boxes in the drop-off area, and I sprinted towards the bike. I'd memorized the position it was in and got there pretty quick. I unpacked my bike and then I looked down. I didn't take off my swim skin. Fuck. By trying to be fast in T1, I had forgotten to take off my swim skin. I was used to using a wetsuit, which is blatantly obvious, you know, when you have it on. So I didn't feel the swim skin when I still had it on around my legs. I ripped it off. What should I do? With the swim skin in my hand, I looked back towards the T1 tent. Should I go back and put it in the bag? No, too far. And the bags are all mixed up by now, being that they were not racked up, but just thrown in big boxes at random. I looked at the bike. Should I just shove it down my tri suit for the bike ride? No way, man. Six hours of riding with this thing heating me up on my chest, no way. I looked to the right and there was a big garbage bin. One of the types that need to be emptied out with a garbage truck. I'll just throw it in there. There is no way they're gonna empty this bin during the event. So just like that, I did something that I thought that I would never do. Bike in my hand, I threw away my new swim skin and took off sprinting towards the transition exit. I lapped my Garmin at the bike mount line and started pedaling. I was feeling good and happy to be on the bike. After 20 seconds, I looked down at the watch and it was still in transition mode. Damn, I must have not pressed the button. I lapped it again and just like that, with some lag, it was suddenly in transition too. No, the watch had lagged so bad it had skipped through the tra triathlon modes. Come on, it's not so bad. I just saved the activity as fast as possible while I was pedaling and then just started a new bike activity. It's all okay, it's basically the same. But in reality, as we will see later, it wasn't. And being out of the tri activity was not ideal at all for one key reason that I will share later. But I had no time to think about this. I had to start cycling. I clearly overdid the first flat part and the first climb, surging quite a bit to try and make up some time loss and overtaking people. I overdid it so much that I got a side stitch in my right side, which was a new thing as on the bike, I never get these kinds of side stitches. Damn, that's a rough start. I decided to back off the effort slightly, but especially to hydrate a lot. First climb went by overtaking people, but also getting overtaken and also falling into a rhythm with riders of a very similar ability to mine until we reached Vance. Here, I had to switch gears in a strange way on an uphill and bam, my chain fell. I had to dismount, put it back on again, damn. But relax, nothing major's happened. Get back on the bike. You've only lost one. Got back on the bike, did the last part of this climb. And after a little while, we reached the first descent. And many of the people I had overtaken on the climb overtook me back flying by. Man, my thoughts in training of, on watts per kilo might have been pretty pointless, I thought. Well, that was not the case entirely, but at this point, it sure seemed that way on this descent. After a downhill, I reached Point Sur Loop. I took a right and I started heading up the climb to Col de Lecre, the second climb and the major one. I was pacing myself for the first part, 11K and I just rode at a comfortable intensity, alternating between aero bars where I could and base bars. Overtaking people, but like before, I basically fell into a range of people who were mostly doing an intensity similar to mine. I paid attention to work a bit harder on the climb, but not overdoing it. Also, I did my best to enjoy what I was experiencing. The people around me coming from all across the world, the scenery, and I was so glad that I'd already ridden the course. The first half of the climb, so the first 10K went by, and I reached the short flat section 
made a right and started the final section up to Col de Lecre. Here, after pacing the first part, I started to go a bit harder, aiming to get up to Lecre as fast as possible without blowing up. The side stitch had vanished, so I was focused on riding to the best of my abilities. I gulped down water, trying to shed some weight from the bike, took a caffeine gel and pedaled. I reached the first switchback at the end of the valley and then climbed up the side of the mountain. Looking back down at the road I just climbed, where there was a river of riders making their way up. Each one of them with months of preparations behind them and with their own personal journey, goals and motivations to be here. This thought struck me and motivated me to make it up to the Lecker. I did the final four turns, passed the Lecker sign and I was over the call. Here I didn't take the foot off the gas. I knew that if I didn't rest and kept pedaling, I could carry quite a bit of momentum to the next part of the course. And I did just that for the first flat part. I got as aero as possible and rode efficient. It was a very nice change of pace to go fast again. After some flat, some small uphills, a downhill with a switchback, I hit the spectacular downhill with tarmac that ended at the base of a tiny three kilometer climb uh, that took us up to Andon. I was feeling kind of okay, but not spectacular, to be honest. I had to be careful with the pace. So I climbed to Andon without much effort, just making sure I was making good progress. After Andon, there was a mellow downhill and then the final climb to a col. This climb is exposed to the right. Hot, but beautiful. I made my way over the col and headed straight down, holding the foot on the gas to reach the plane with the rolling out and back section. This section was contraflow, so on the other side of the road, and it was pretty sketchy, honestly. But I put my head down and rode to the best of my abilities, in the beginning of what was gonna be the 30 kilometers of rolling terrain. The out and back is fairly uneventful, so I focused on staying aero and being efficient taking in liquids and a caffeine gel before reaching the turnaround. At this point, there wasn't much overtaking going on. I think I got overtook by one person, but everybody was kind of like in their rhythm. Then I reached the turnaround and I started heading back for five kilometers. The way back felt harder than the way out. The rolling uphill sections started feeling harder than they should have. I relaxed a bit, took the foot off the gas a bit and just focused on making forward progress, checking my average power and heart rate, which were all within range. I wasn't in pain, but I could tell I was starting to fatigue a bit, both physically and mentally. This rolling section seemed, just like in the recon ride, to last forever, alternating between flats, uphills and descents that all looked quite similar, weaving in and out of the forest, and, but mostly being exposed to the sun. This led me to realize that it was clearly starting to heat up at this point. Finally, at kilometer 113, I reached the first sign of the first big descent. Let's go, I thought. The descent is stunning, really beautiful, and is a gradient which allows us to pedal down. I reached the spectacular part of road which is excavated in the rocks. And here, after taking in the beauty of the place, I saw it. In the first short tunnel, two riders had collided and were lying there with paramedics on a stretcher. Okay bro, full focus now on being as on point as you can. No f ups. We are here to finish this race without crashing. First goal in Ironman for me, of course, is to get to the finish line. No finish line no medal. So the number one thing to avoid, but it is something that I always forget, is crashing and ending the race by making a stupid mistake or by losing focus cannot happen. It just can't happen. With this renewed alertness, I kept on pedaling without taking any major risks and enjoyed the chance to be able to recover a bit. But before I knew it, I reached the third and final climb. It was time to put my head down, push on the pedals. This final climb, I just decided to go by feel without putting myself in too much of a danger zone regarding intensity. It was starting to get really hot, like really hot. So I took in fluids, ended up for a brief while with some other guys on the road, but then I just rode my own pace and settled into what was a solid climbing intensity for me, letting them go. I was fatigued, no doubt. So I couldn't really make any pacing mistakes by allowing myself to be with other people who were doing their own pace and overdoing it at this point. Even though I was Five to six hours in, it was still a very long day. After an aid station, a gel, and a few switchbacks, I reached the first false summit of the last climb, which led into a descent, and then a final one kilometer climb. Here, on the final one kilometer, I pushed a bit more. I was at a point where all I was thinking was, I just want this climb to be over. I just wanted to finish. By the end of this last 10 kilometer climb, I could already tell I was feeling tired and beat up. But I had to stay on point physically and mentally for the Navi final descent. I reached the summit, picked up a full big bike bottle of cola from an aid station to be as heavy as possible for the descent and started charging down. I was focused, intentional, with some minor risk taking on the descent and wanted to maximize the speed and efficiency that I could get on this descent. It's free speed. I rode one switch back to the left and I saw another rider who had crashed and was holding his collar. Not a nice thing to see, 
but a good reminder to really pay attention to what I was doing. Then I headed on the two kilometer false flat section and all of a sudden I heard, damn, is this the gas in the cola bottle I got at the aid station leaking out or have I just flattered? That dreaded noise didn't seem to be coming from the bottle, unfortunately. This made me get off my bike and look at the rear tire. I was almost certain that I'd flattered. To my utter disbelief and happiness, the tire was, it was perfect, no puncture. Damn water bottle, losing gas. That sounded exactly like a flat tire. I cursed the cola bottle a bit, but in reality, I was just happy that there was no flat. This stop meant losing another one to two minutes and the people that I had overtaken in the past section of the scent all overtook me again, thought. So I resumed riding, had to re-overtake them, and, but I started making some good progress. After weaving through villages and back roads, this long descent ended. And there was a still fairly long, flat, kind of little bit downhill section. Here I charged quite a bit. I was feeling good after having recovered a bit on the descent and wanted to try and bank as much time as possible on this fairly easy part. There was not much wind and it was hot, but it was absolutely manageable. At one point there was a roundabout, I was going fast and I saw an athlete in front of me that was kind of like moving to the left of the road and I couldn't figure out why. I overtook him while alerting him by yelling a bit and then I immediately realized that there was an indication pointing left and that's why he was moving left. So to the guy I overtook, causing maybe some problems, making that turn, sorry bro, I didn't mean it. I tried to tell you in transition but you were mega focused on getting through it quick. After passing under a bridge and doing a 270 turn, we crossed the same bridge that we went out on and we were back into town. I was very excited. I always get hyped in the last five kilometers, being very simply that I just want to get off the damn bike. This happens every time to be honest, but this time I felt it even more, very probably because I just spent one hour extra on the bike. The last section was bordering the airport, then I was on the Promenade des Anglais. I could see the other people out on the run course already, and I couldn't wait to get started. Enough with the pedaling, it's time to run. Put my head down, pushed, and before I knew it, I was at the dismount line. After a five hour 45 bike split, for the full 180K with 2,400 meters of elevation, making it a 31.3 kilometer average pace, right on target with what I perceived I could do to then sustain a decent marathon. Now, it was just a matter of seeing what would happen on the run. Entering T2, I felt my legs were tired, but not as tired as when I had done the bike course recon. Good, I thought. Time to see what I've really got. I wasn't really moving very fast in transition, to be honest, because I was feeling a little bit fatigued. Not ideal, of course, but I had to make it work. Bike racked, Helmet unbuckled, I ran towards the bag racks, put on my alpha flyers, grabbed my hat with shades and Ziploc bag inside, chugged the Monster Energy, grabbed a water bottle from a T2 table and headed out on the run. As soon as I went out on the run course, the heat hit me. It was gonna be hot, no doubt about it. But after a few kilometers, reality hit me. I was feeling beat up in a worse shape than any other Ironman I'd ever done. And this feeling was absolutely not helped by the things that I saw surrounding me. On the course, so many athletes were already doing full-on zombie marches, crushed to having to walk by the intense demanding bike course, and now by the pretty insane heat. I was really taken aback by this. Usually the zombie marches start later in the event, like loop three or four. But here, even though they might have had a 40 to 50 minutes advantage of me by starting in an earlier age group, it meant that the zombies were on the second loop, no more. And the thing is, they all looked fit. Not only looked, they were amongst the fittest people on the planet, but the conditions were reducing them to walking. What would happen to me if these guys were already crushed? Be cautious of the heat. Drink and stay as cool as possible, I thought. I quickly realized I was in another bad spot. My heart rate wouldn't go up. Even with such high temperatures, because it was 2 p.m. so the sun was blaring, my heart rate was very low. I was running based on heart rate and I kept on trying to get it past 150, but it just wouldn't rise. I knew that to do the best marathon that I could, I needed to hold above 150. And this is a very bad sign. When the heart rate won't rise, it means that you are too fatigued to run hard. This had already happened to me. And the last time this had happened to me was in my first Ironman. And we all know how that ended up. Literally not being able to run any faster than six 30 minute Ks all while feeling destroyed. But I decided to stay in the moment. The heart rate wasn't going up, but it might eventually. I was feeling shattered, but that might just be a passing phase that could potentially get better. This is the long race. All the fatigue, emotions, and things I was feeling were new. I had never been in this exact situation in my life, so I couldn't really make predictions on how it would go. Be here now, stay in the present, and deal with it. The first loop, everything is new. The course was flat, hot, and with a lot of people in the first section, and the novelty helps to make it go past. I did my best to take in the energy of the crowds, the music, and it was pretty epic, to be honest. Just being out there felt epic. Running on the promenade road with so many people, 
felt like a really special event atmosphere. I made my way out of town, smiling and thanking the public cheering me on. And I had a mega pleasant surprise. Gianfranco, the boss of PPR team, my triathlon team, was on the side cheering me on. What a sight. He had seen me grow from a complete noob from day one in triathlon, starting with nothing, helping me a lot along the way, and now we were meeting each other on the run course of the Ironman World Championship. This is crazy, I thought. I was so happy to see him, and it made running feel easier, even for just a couple of minutes. I was hyped. This went on until I reached the stretch of course out of the city, close to the airport. Here, the surroundings became more and more desolate. Crowds were absent, and the shade non-existent. Man, this section is gonna be tough later. And boy, was I right. I reached the out point, and as I started making my way back to town to conclude the first loop, the hype I had been feeling at the start really was waning fast. And slowly, the concept of still having to run for a long time really started to set in. I was sitting in kilometer splits between 4.30 and 4.50, but it felt tremendously hard. A lot harder than Hamburg, and a lot harder than in train. Probably the bike had taken more out of me than I expected. Running back into town, I welcomed every stand with music as a gift, leaning into the power of music to give me just a little bit more energy, and the sounds of the crowd cheering to pick me up and make every step a little easier. Every aid station was cola, water, Gatorade and ice, and whenever there were those sprinkling showers, I passed under them, try and keep cool. I was determined to not let heat impact my running, or at least limit its effects. Almost at the end of loop one, I made a big mistake. As I took a cup of water, gulped it down, and it had ice in it. Some uneasiness started to bubble in my stomach. I reached the turnaround for the first loop, feeling pretty low. Here is where I started entering a really dark place, a lot earlier than usual, right around this point at the turnaround, so 11 kilometers in the marathon. My legs and especially my glutes, my left glute, were thrashed and hurting like crazy. And another first time thing happened. I was forced to take a mandatory emergency port loop stop, hemorrhaging two minutes that I really could not afford to lose. Getting out of the port loop, I thought 11 kilometers in, 31 still to go. HR not cooperating, stomach problems. I'm fucked, I thought. But to my astonishment, this emergency port loop stop served as a bit of a reset. After the stop, I got back on the course feeling better and resumed running. I was in no way, shape or form in a good spot though. At this point, I truly understood that we were in for a hard roller coaster of a run in which things could have gone south really badly and really quickly too. Okay, we are definitely going to finish this run, but how? That I don't know on my thoughts. While I was running the next kilometers towards the airport, more and more people along the course were walking. Damn, this is gonna be tough. Then I saw the first runner lying on the side of the road with medical paying attention to him. Damn, the heat is no joke. The heat was clearly the biggest factor that could impact the execution of the race. Because many things can slow you down, but I realized that the consequences from overheating and maybe dehydration could really be severe. And the possibility of a DNF was real. So at this point, I started analyzing my situation in a new way that I'd never done before. I started asking myself, what is the limiter of my performance in this moment? What isn't allowing me and is limiting me to run at the pace that I train at. Is it the legs? Yes, definitely. My legs, and especially my glutes, left glute, were hurting like never before in an Ironman. So the legs were a limiter. Is it the heat? A bit, but at this point, not so much yet. Is the limiter my mind, not willing to push the effort required? Yes. I realized that my mind, which I consider to be one of my strengths, was the biggest limiter, together with the legs, and then the heat, as I progressed on the second loop. My mind was stopping me from running hard. There was no option at this point. To get the most out of myself, in this moment, I had to resort to hardening the f up mentally to deal with my mind limiter. And here, let's be clear, I don't want to sound like a wannabe Goggins, but honestly, this was the only solution. Having straightened out my mind, I resumed running a bit harder and it was time to deal with the rest. To deal with the glute and leg pain, I resorted to getting help from a 600 milligram ibuprofen and one capsule of full endurance fusion. Try and lower both pain and perceived exertion. Then, still running, I started scheming. To get through this marathon, I needed a new game plan. Doing it like Hamburg was not gonna work. I started running as hard as I could for as long as I could, managing to get my heart rate up past 150, and when I couldn't sustain the pace anymore, be it because of the legs or the heat, which was both physical, mental, and condition dependent, so mind, body, and heat, I would revert to running easy until I reached an aid station. At the aid station, I would walk, throw water over my head, drink as much water and Gatorade as I could to avoid dehydration, and shove ice down the back of my neck, in the tri-suit and sometimes under my hat. 
trying to stay as cool as possible, so dealing with the heat. Arguably, this was the most important thing to do, staying cool. Then, when the A station was over, I would resume running hard and repeat the same structure. So basically, I resorted to a run-walk strategy, something that I personally had never done. But I'd seen people use it, good results, in events that I had taken part in. Namely, my first Ironman. I clearly remember in Tallinn, a dude with a Ryzen kit doing a run-walk strategy with every aid station walking and drinking, and he was getting very good results. He dropped me during the race. I felt that I couldn't sustain a 4.30 pace because of the legs, mine and heat, but I could sustain it for four or five minutes. After that, reverting to five minute Ks felt easy. And then I knew that walking the A station would help me cool down, reset, and attack the next stretch of the course. I took a Red Bull cup too many, which started to make me feel really a bit on edge and anxious, so I quit taking in caffeine until further notice. And what can I say? It worked. I clocked the first half marathon in still a fairly decent for me, 144. And then the final two loops were seriously some of the most hard mentally and physically moments I have ever felt in my life. I started loop three and midway through the, this loop is when I realized that I didn't have the total time elapsed since I had had that problem on the bike start. How long have I been going for? I tried to do some quick math but my brain was kind of fuzzy and I couldn't really come up with a solid number of how much time had passed. Then I thought, okay, I know I started at 7.15, so all I can do is check my run splits and see at what time of day I am. I knew from the get-go as a goal that sub 10 on this course was not really an option for me. But sub 11 was within reach and honestly it was my, let's say, main goal, time goal for this event. I realized to say sub 11 hours, I needed to come in before 6.15 p.m. As I was running, I asked someone for the time on the side of the road and I realized that I could still make it if I sustain this pace and strategy. Let's go. I would feel consistently like garbage and the aid stations always seem to get further and further away one from the other, especially the long stretch of the course down out of the city next to the airport and back into town became a brutally long slog. There was one part especially, the return from the out and back at the airport. This was a silent, long stretch without aid stations part of the course. One thing that really did help me was identifying a guy with an orange and black tri suit who was pacing perfect five minute kilometers or around that mark, maybe a bit less. I could hold on with him for a bit, then I would slow down at the aid stations and when I resumed running, I would look for him further ahead and catch up. This worked, it gave me a goal to work towards and something that I could aim to catch up to and every aid station, this situation would repeat itself. Also, at this point, I really did my best to feed off the crowd's energy when I would run back into town, and especially whenever I could hear some music. It really helped me to tap into some hidden reserves of energy and willpower tucked away somewhere deep in my mind. I also thought about all you guys at home tracking on the iMana, all the messages I got in the days before the race, and it really helped me with keeping putting one foot in front of the other. Loop four was one of the most challenging things I've ever had to endure. I was wrecked, to be honest, but I really wanted to make this moment count. In town, I hyped myself up, doing consistent run walk and running hard. And after having taken loop three off caffeine, I took in half of our caffeine gel to try and get the final extra boost. Run hard, then run easy, then aid station, walk, ice, water, Gatorade, cola, thank the volunteers and resume running hard. Somehow I made it through the silent and lonely out and back at the airport on the final loop. And I got to turn around and I started the final five kilometers. Here at the turnaround, I met up with Benjamin, a dude from California I had chatted with the day before. We ran together in the barren section right next to the airport, shared some pain and it helped to make some meters go by. Are you going home, man? He asked me. Yeah, it's the last four kilometers. Go for it, bro. And at that moment, I realized how close I actually was to the finish. At this point, I went through an incredibly emotional moment. I had already experienced this, both in Hamburg and Tallinn, but here it was, simply put, next level. The last months leading into this event had been really tough, and without realizing it, I had bottled up so much. Here, all that pent-up energy was transformed into a positive energy. Everything bad that had happened had taught me a lot. It had taught me to really practice self-belief, held just to believe. In the past months, I realized that I needed to start really believing, to believe in myself, but for real. Before, I, I was kind of thinking that I believed. I thought that I had faith, but these months had taught me to level up. They taught me that you need to believe, feeling it to the profound of your core. You need to believe that everything happens for a reason, that God gives you only what you can handle. And especially you need to believe that everything will go in the best way possible. I needed to learn to believe 
with unshakable conviction that I was stronger than I thought, more capable, more durable, tougher, smarter, and especially then act upon this belief. In the final two kilometers, as I finally was reaching the finish line, I reflected on the past months and years, how much had changed and how much my life has transformed in this brief period of time, where I started from and the situation I found myself in today, I did my best to really savor the moment. This run was an experience like no other I have ever felt in my life. It was, simply put, transformative. I had taken the first step on the course, one person, and I was reaching the finish line as a different one. Running around the chute, it was full of spectators and an absolutely amazing energy. I took those final steps that I'd worked so hard for and I crossed the arch. And I'm not gonna lie, a couple of tears came down. This had been a truly epic experience. I totally get that for some, this might sound overly spiritual. Chill out, it's just a race, bro, some will say. Well, honestly, to me, it's not. It is so much more. Iron Man, for me, has always been a tool for growth, both physical, mental, and spiritual. The best physical and mental expression of this tool, aka the training and the race itself, is the most transformative thing that I've found up to this point. These, to me, have not been races. These have been truly epic five years of a journey. A journey that I started just based off doing what my intuition told me made me feel great. Grow, progress, and align my actions with my values. I consider myself lucky to now be able to help and inspire others to embrace a life based on health, physical fitness, mental challenge and well-being, and personal development through this channel. So I can do nothing but thank Iron Man for transforming my life. After the finish line, a really nice volunteer gave me my medal, my towel, and I headed back to the chill out spot in the back. Honestly, I was so glad it was over. I had literally no energy left. I was completely done. If I had to do one more loop, I don't know, seriously, if I could have done it. Well, yes, of course I could have done it, but it wouldn't have been pleasant. I met up with Gianfranco in the back. I had a few things to eat, took a couple of photos, and I really tried to savor and really feel all these feelings to try and remember them forever. Final runtime was three hours, 31 minutes, which considering all the crazy things that had happened during the run, Doing the run only six minutes slower than Hamburg for me, it's a good result for the day and the conditions and how I felt and the conditioning that I can surely improve on, but that on that day, it was all that I could do. I couldn't have done more. So the total finish time was 10 hours and 41 minutes, sub 11, which was what I come to Nice for. And I think I got something like 60th uh, in my age group. So top 30% and 300 or something in the overall standings. So top 15% overall. How do you quantify this result compared to things that I've done before? For the all-world athlete standings, there is a point system that starts when the first age grouper crosses the finish line. It starts at 5,000 and every minute that passes, it lowers down. So comparing the results from Hamburg and from Nice, they were extremely similar. So even though the times, you can't really tell by the times because the course is different, it's course dependent. And they are also depth of field dependent. But honestly, they were very similar between Hamburg and Nice. So I'm pretty stoked with the result. I really don't think I could have done any better. So some final thoughts that I think might be interesting and maybe useful. I entered this race being extremely burnt out, not only by the training, but moreover, the stress that had surrounded the last few months. This had been the first time I had prepared two Ironmans in one year. So having a taste of the preparation required for a world championship qualification cycle. So this was how I had entered the event, burnt out possibly thinking, I don't know if I'll ever do this again. But during the event and after the event, I really gained an insane amount of respect and appreciation for the sport because this sport really helped shape and transform my life. And everything that I'd done, even though I felt burnt out in the moment, I really appreciated having done it because it really impacted my life. That's what I felt. So I came out of the event with a renewed appreciation and love for the sport. I love triathlon, I love Ironman. I love Ironman 70.3, I love Ironman preparation. In the moment, it is very, very tough, but it is one of a kind. Life coach, life transformation, it is really awesome in my opinion. So I came out of the event with a renewed love for the sport, which is great, to be honest. What things did I learn specifically from the race day? I learned that adaptability and fast decision-making under pressure, being able to adapt our plan and to make split-second decisions that might impact a long day like an Ironman. Trusting our gut, oftentimes, that, that's the thing. Trusting our gut is absolutely key, it's fundamental, and I believe it carries over to a lot of other aspects of our life. Fast decision-making under pressure for high-consequence things, I think can be a very useful skill in other areas. I learned that 
presence in the moment is precious. I realized that when is the last time I have spent a full 12 hours without a phone, without a screen, with no distractions, pushing my natural limits, no music. I literally couldn't think of a day in the last years that that's happened. Pushing my limits in a zero distraction, full focused setting was very cool and something that I have a great appreciation with. I also learned to have a deeper appreciation of my health, my body and my mind. Being able to take on these challenges truly is a gift, both physically and mentally. And I come away from this event not taking those things for granted at all and actually making an effort to appreciate them every single day. Bonus thing that I learned is that music is an insanely powerful motivator and tool to access some deep emotional energy. This in training was a given because you can train with music, but on race day, Nice was very different from Hamburg. And this might seem like a silly thing, but it was a big thing for me. Hamburg at the race course is in a sort of like chill area of a town with a park. And there were loads of people there just doing picnics, boom boxes or makeshift DJ booths. So there was a lot more music feed off from. In Nice, there were maybe two, three spots max. And the difference in hype and energy could definitely be felt. What did I do wrong? So what were the biggest mistakes in this event? So one thing that really rubs me the wrong way was that I forgot to bring a pen to fill in the emergency contact details on the back of the VIP. I know this sounds stupid and it is a tiny detail, but after having forgotten the same exact thing in Hamburg, I'd wanted to make a point of bringing a pen to be able to complete this step. This in a broader context just means attention to detail of everything, not only on the race itself, but on the things surrounding it. Another thing that I messed up a lot was the taper. I did too much too close to the event. As I said in the training video, I had to do the last 27k long run, two weeks out and not three, because I'd stubbed my toe really badly and could not perform it on the day that I should have. Doing this two weeks out might have brought on some additional latent fatigue that showed itself on race day. This happened because I did too much in the days leading up to the event. Having done that session so close, I should have taken some sessions out. Also, I had to walk around a lot of the time um, to grocery stores or to the race expo and so on. The day before the race needs to be a day of resting and the days before need to be very, very light. I will pay attention to this the next time. I messed up the first 15 kilometers on the bike, letting my spirits run too hot and doing too much power to try and get away from the huge pack of people. I burnt a couple too many matches here for sure and I paid for it later. So definitely a thing that I will do moving on is to pay more attention in the first part of the race to really keep myself calm because it is a very long section of the race. Another thing I messed up was I didn't go low fiber enough the days before the race, which translated to the porta potty stop on the run, I believe. Next time I will do without bananas and especially legumes from five days out and not three. I might be a little bit more lax on the fruit, but legumes will disappear from the diet the week of the race. Another thing that I had mixed results with was focusing on getting lean and light to achieve a higher watts per kilo. Work. This worked on the uphills, but was a detriment on the downhills. Many riders who were heavier than me, had a heavier bike than me, after I had overtaken them on the uphills, came flying by me on the downhills. Literally flying. I tried to mitigate this by always having full water bottles to weigh more when I tackled the last downhills. Final thing that isn't really a mistake, but I could have run a bit harder, but this is really easy to say after the fact. In the moment, I really was at max capacity, but it was more max due to the fact that I was very overall depleted not because the running effort I was doing on the, on the run really was max marathon effort. I realized that I need to train more and pace the bike better. So a little less back off the bike a bit to have ample energy to run the marathon. Also, I'm not gonna lie, I've reached the limit on this bike frame and setup. I see how other people around me with better bikes and with better setups, they just go faster me because they're more aero, more proficient at, at the same power. Next year, I will try and upgrade the framing wheels. Here, I have one last consideration that kind of like rubs me the wrong way. So this is finish line etiquette. If you're not gunning for time and you're not about to miss out on your goal by seconds, please don't do what this dude did. The dude right behind me overtook me with a big ass flag right in front of me on the finish line. After I purposely slowed down to let the guy in front of me have his moment. Like, what the f are you thinking, bro? This guy just sprinted past me with a huge flag on the finish line. He ruined three photos that will never be taken again for no reason at all, but to save like seven seconds. Finish line etiquette, I believe is really important because it gives uh, everybody the chance and experience to really take in that moment. So just, this is just my opinion eh? and I, I have no hate for this guy, but I personally, I would never do something like this. What's next? So next is gravel, trail and ultra running. And I don't think I'm gonna be trying to qualify for Kona next year because the number of slots is severely limited. It's around 800, I think, versus the 2026 uh, cycle, which is gonna be 2,400 slots, which I think is more doable for me. I will try and go for Kona full focus in 2026, I think. 
Next year, I think I will do one Ironman with the goal of going as fast as possible and as close to nine hours as possible. I feel that there is still definitely a lot of room for improvement compared to Hamburg. As far as actual goals go, so this year, one of the goals that I had was to do a 50K ultra trail run and I've already done it. Uh, I did Ultra Trail Lago Maggiore mm, a couple of weeks ago. It was absolutely epic experience, really hard, eight hours of running up two mountains. It was absolutely awesome. Um, and I just basically pivoted my Ironman fitness into ultra trail running and it works really well. So if you're looking for on a new challenge, ultra running might be a thing to consider. And I'm really looking forward to doing other events like this. If you are thinking of taking on this challenge, be it a 70.3 or an Ironman, I can't but recommend it highly. It really is worth it in my experience, under the physical, mental, and the community aspects. Okay guys, thanks for watching the video. That's all I can think of to put in this vid. I think there's quite a lot of stuff, and I hope you found some takeaways to apply to your own racing so that you don't make the mistakes that I made. The Ironman World Championship in Nice was a great experience, and I'm really, really happy and grateful of how it turned out. It is a memory that I cherish very deeply, a one-of-a-kind experience that I hope you guys can find your own version of, be it in Ironman, 70.3, 70.3 Worlds, ultra running, ultra swimming, gravel cycling, whatever it is, go for it. When you're presented with an opportunity, take it, go for it, because you never know what might happen to you, to yourself, to your mind, to your body, and what you might get to experience by doing it. If it doesn't challenge us, it won't change us, and I really believe that. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next video.